Okay, hi guys, my name is Piotr, I work for Walk About Games, and today we'll be talking about marketing and PR during pandemic times. Can you guys introduce yourself? Sean. Maybe. Oh, there we go, who's going first? Who's going first? Uh, my <laughs> name's Sean Petraschuk. Uh I'm with Evolve PR, an agency out of uh, Canada. Uh, we work with multiple titles all across, all across the world, not quite as focused as, some, as a single publisher, so a little more all over the map. So I, if I need to help with promoting my game, I go to you. That's right. I mean, we work with a ton of uh, independent developers. We actually work with Patrick and uh, 11-bit as well. Um, and yeah, like, so, you know, we take on everything from the, you know, the small indie guys right through up to, you know, AAA titles as well. So we're definitely, uh, we have a broad focus of, of uh, products that we get to work with. Oh, so people can gossip about you with Patrick. Patrick, can you tell more about you? Well, Patrick and I know each other quite well. You know, I mean, if you want any of the dirty secrets, I can give you those <laughs> later. But we'll wait till we're off air for that. So, Patrick. Yeah, hi, my name is Patrick Grzeszczuk. I'm from 11 Bit Studios. Uh, I'm coping with uh, all the marketing-related things here, also with Sean. <laughs> and Thomas, you? <laughs> Hey guys, uh, nice, nice, nice to be here, and welcome to all the viewers as well. Um, I work at Remedy Entertainment as the communication director, which basically means I look after our games. What do we say? Uh, how do we show the games uh, and the company uh, brand as well? And it's been an interesting, well, not just the last couple of weeks, but um, last couple of years as we've kind of moved from like working on a single game for years and years and years to working on four different projects at the moment. Uh, so what I would want to focus more about in this panel discussion is tips and tricks from you because probably you are the best guys in the industry to, to talk to you about it. Uh, how to do stuff during this weird time. So my first question is, what tools do you use to, to, to work during the pandemic and to what type of work, what your schedule looks like? How, what did you do to maintain your productivity, your effectiveness uh, of the work you've done while not being in the office? And maybe Thomas, you'll start. Yeah. Um... I think number one is you have to have like even more discipline. Um, people tend to kind of you wander to your computer. I mean, we've been working from home since early early March, though we have quite a lot of people in the offices. The situation in Finland is actually quite quite good, knock on wood. Um, but it's the first month was really just endless calls, endless calls and meetings. Some people have that even in the office, but um, we we had, I was part of, still I am kind of the remedy sort of COVID slash remote working task force. So we basically then every day met and had to figure stuff out and then IT did the heavy lifting really. And then once in that, after that three weeks, things kind of settled down. A lot of the things are just technical. You can sort them out. And then it became a much more question about, well, how do we, maintain culture um, and and some people, you know, people, there are lots of different people, people take this very different ways. But um, for me, like I just enforce that my Mondays and Tuesday, I try to put all of my calls into Monday and Tuesday. And for quite a while at Remedy, we tried to keep Wednesday meeting free. Um, and that's been very good. And I'm pretty adamant about that because you, you end up being just in calls all day. You end up not actually writing the stuff down and processing things and trying to figure stuff out. Um, so I kind of front load my week with a bunch of calls. And then towards the end of the week, I try to have less and less. But it's Slack, which Remedy has had for quite a while. And then I think in two weeks after the pandemic, we were all about Zoom. So do those, so Slack pretty, was Zoom. those pretty much. And then what was good was quite a, a while ago, we started heavily investing into Confluence, so having a lot more documentation and all that, and Confluence has been very important in terms of best practices and all of these sorts of things, because, you know, documentation, whether you're a dev or it's just documentation, always falls by the wayside. Sorry, long answer, but uh, that that's just some of the things. No, but it's a really cool answer. And, and Patrick, how does it look in 11 bits? So, honestly speaking, I think that we haven't changed much in terms of the tools that we use. Mm -hmm. um, it is just about the intensity, I would say. So the ratio has changed along the way. Uh, right now, I am way more often on Slack, um, up to the point in which we, 
like turn our heads towards like the remote work, right? So Slack was something that I was using like from time to time. Right now it is my daily bread, so to speak. Um, uh, but honestly, I like the, the funny thing and the thing that surprised me at first was was the fact that actually I got more productive once we started our remote remote work because there is no way for me to burn my time like having a casual chit chat uh, with someone like in a corridor, right? So so usually we do have like multiple calls every day, like conf calls and whatnot. But those calls are down to business. <laughs> we are just no one wants to chat about anything. We just have things to cover and then we move along with, with whatever we have next in our pipeline. So so uh, in that manner, I think that we are doing like we have managed to stay productive, equally productive, if not more productive on some of the fields. Probably when it comes to I will to say that absolutely hundred percent the same for us. Like right. Exactly so, the same thing. Yeah. Like there's no time. There's no time for bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> also, like uh, you, you are saving some time on the commute. I mean, so, so yeah. usually it would take me like a, a an hour to get to the office, maybe a bit less than that, but like thirty to forty minutes to get to the office and the same amount of time to get back home. Right now, I can like use my time productively, even though actually right now I am at the office, but. But but uh, it is mixed, right? Some people are working from home still. Some people are appearing in the office from time to time, myself included. Uh, but basically, like the the, the 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 daily tasks are not a challenge for us. What is challenging, probably, is the like, the creative cooperation. I would say, at least from my point of view, right? When I have to deal with something on my own, that's that's the easy part. When I have to like manage something or discuss something with with someone else, that's the easy part as well. But when we have to get together and think about something and come up with some solutions, well, there is nothing like that can compare to your like not physical contact, but sitting with someone in the same room and just exchanging thoughts, like yeah, throwing out ideas, right? Body. Yeah, I it's think. it's it's way healthier, and this is something that I'm craving for. I would say. And this is something that I miss quite a lot. This is why we try to, uh, in a safely way, but get together from time to time, at least to to just uh, um, make up for the for the time that we have to spend. spend the time. And can you say how frequent you are trying to meet? Is it once a week, once a month? Oh, uh, it depends. It depends. It, it, it is not like you know. It is a rule that everyone yeah, yeah, has right. to. Or uh, for me, it's like right now I'm once, twice a week at the office, meeting with different people. Um, but I do have a colleagues of mine uh, who are uh, not, that, not, not as often. They are like um, coming uh, to, to the office like once in two weeks or something like that. So basically, it depends on the uh, profile of, of, of the project that you are working on and the necessity that is that is on the table at any given moment. So, so I would say that it is a mixed bag of things. Yeah, like I'm hearing, is probably once a month everybody will meet with each other. Um, yeah, on the average. And Sean, how does PR agency work? So, so I mean, I think um, we were in a pretty good position to adapt to the pandemic in a sense because we were already working remotely as a team, right? So Evolve has around 20 odd uh, people spread throughout Canada and everybody already works from home. So for us, it was less about it was less about, oh, how do you learn to work from home and more about helping the clients that we work with adapt to the challenges that they were having, right? You started experiencing things like delays and, and holdups and, and you know, like, you know, like Patrick kind of touched on their creative process has kind of changed a little bit as well, right? So we were helping kind of mitigate that. Um, but what I did find is that, I mean, the longer people tend to work from home, um, you know, you fall into a routine. And for a lot of us where this has been a kind of our bread and butter for a long time, our routine would involve, you know, for mental health, especially is you get out of the house, you maybe you're going to go to a coffee shop to, to work for part of your day because you're craving that little bit of connection, right? And now, I mean, like you guys are talking about, you're getting a, 
a Zoom meeting versus a face to face, and it's just it's it's not the same. So um, personally, at least on my side, um, I found that like I've needed to change my self care routine because it's really easy to fall into. I wake up, I'm an early riser because my my you know most of my clients are in Poland, for example, right? So I'm working at six in the morning, so I don't keep you guys you know going until you know ten o'clock at night and stuff like that. But I would get up and I would work. And it'd be suddenly 5 p.m. my time, and I've just sat in front of a computer all day. Yeah. So changing your self care, and and I mean, I would imagine people who are maybe watching, they're they're nodding right now. They're like, I'm with you, I'm with you on this. And then this is where I usually will lose people is when I say the most important thing for for me especially has been stopping and exercising. Yeah, I, so I'm like it's morning after I wake up, I go to the pool to swim. So yeah. yeah, and like for me, it's been running and 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 hitting the. Luckily, I have a gym set up here at home, right? So making sure that I take time to recharge and don't fall into, you know, where you're just working constantly without you know without rest. Um, but uh, organization, um, we were really lucky as well in that we had picked up on a platform called ClickUp well before the pandemic started. And it's been really valuable for us in organizing our days because of it. I mean, not only do we work with, you know, my coworkers, but just when you've got, I don't know how many different clients Evolve has as a whole, but when you're trying to work on multiple projects, being able to set up spaces for each client and each task and there's subtasks and checklists, it's a really, you can get super granular if you want, it gets a little bit crazy, but ClickUp as, a, as an organizational tool, I mean, even if you were on the publisher side, say you've got three or four games that you're working on, it allows you to really kind of keep each project in its lane. You can add on all your documentation, it works well with Google and all that sort of stuff, but it just really allows you to keep a really clean line and deadlines, start dates, like you know who's awesome. slipping, you know why they're slipping, you know I mean? So if you're in a leadership position too, you can be, you can follow up and say, hey, we noticed that this deadline is passed. You didn't quite finish it, you know, and how do we adapt, right? So for anybody looking for an organizational tool, I was really, I was really, I didn't want to change. We were, <laughs> we were kind of just doing more uh, tracking time. And then it was notebooks and chattering along the team. And I was like, like, if it's not broken, don't fix it kind of attitude. And I was really resistant to, to using ClickUp. But once I got to, to know the program, now it's it's I'm real I'm I'm anal about it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Patrick, do you think that there are some things that you learned during this pandemic times that you want to you will want to keep in your daily schedule after the world will hopefully return to normal? Are there some things you discovered that might work better and that we learned it the hard way? Mm, I think that uh, the main lesson that we have learned would be that we can adjust our schedule and 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 our like working model so to speak to different configurations and and um di different circumstances so to speak right so so i think that like working remotely now is going to be something way more common in our office and something that some people may treat as their major line of work maybe right so and that was not the case before we had some of our colleagues working remotely for, with us but but now seeing that well it's not such a big deal we can manage and everything like nothing explodes and and things are things are fine basically uh, like speaking about the company <laughs> not about like the grand scheme of things, but um, we can, yeah, we, we can accept that, we can deal with that. And, and so, so it, it, is, it is comforting to some degree, you know what I mean? It, it is like, okay, so, okay. We, we don't have to, yeah, we don't have to be as attached to those, to, to the ways we were doing things in the past, because like doing things in multiple other ways, works equally well for us. So so let's just experiment, I would say. Yeah. So I must end with you. Uh, I think can you hear Thomas? I think you might be muted. Yeah, yeah. sorry. Classic. Um, <laughs> I, I would say it's pretty much the the same for us as what, what Patrick said. Um, and I'd go back to his original answer that the interesting thing is like when you have all these calls 
you really don't have time to like the usual complaining and that sort of thing which is part of being in the office you're like having a coffee and you gotta let people vent you know either the build is not working and why isn't this too, like like that's part of of it and people need to do that but i don't really miss that the few times i've now gone to the office nice to see people an hour later we're already like why isn't this like this and working I'm like you know what i don't miss any of that there's just <laughs> no time th- time for it here and and at remedy we um you know, multiple people worked remotely, but it's a whole different thing when it's the majority. It's like network bandwidth and all of that. And and we've done like a lot of work on all of that, that moving on, like pretty much working remotely is as good as being in the office. Though the one joke we do have that our own in-house engine, Northlight, it's truly the in-house engine because it's literally built to work in the office. Like it's just not very friendly when it comes to like external development and those sorts of things. But again, that's just like, okay, I guess we need to actually really focus um, on on that. So Sean, since your, your life didn't change that much, I'll, I'll, I'll start with the next question. And it's about virtual mm-hmm. events, which are happening more and more of them become. So how do you choose which one are important to which one you should appear in and which are, are worth your while? Because for sure you need to prepare for all of them. So how do you choose them? And, and what you can gain out of them. So, so a lot of this uh, for us has always depended on clients' needs. Um, you know, some clients are in a position where they've got products where they do want to show, whereas other clients are maybe taking a little bit more of a back seat and stuff like that, right? Um, but really what it came down to is, is like we knew as soon as E3 wasn't going to happen, you know, that everybody and their dog, every media outlet's going to want to step up and fill the space, right? The naughty three type digital events. Yeah. Um, and so uh, when we saw that first one kind of come out of the gate, which was like IGN Summer of Gaming was kind of the big one. Um, we were really lucky. We managed to get a hold of them early. We got a lot of really great traction for many of the products that, you know, that Evolve is covering. Um, and we saw really good numbers on day one, uh, pretty good numbers on day two, but then we immediately started to notice, in a sense, diminishing returns, right? And then you, you know, as soon as that event was over, we started rolling into multiple different digital events. And there was lots of little ones, you know, escapist, then there's the Gamescom stuff, and the now there's the pack stuff. Yeah, and so I, I think the, uh, the challenge right now has become you know, you're getting diminishing returns from event to event to event because not only are we burnt out of trying to juggle which event do we join and which one's going to get us the biggest bang for a buck. Because one thing you have to think about too is that uh, we don't have numbers on any of this. Like PC Gaming Show this year did very well, but considering the situation we're in, there was no guarantees on the numbers, on the viewers, on any of it, right? So now it's kind of you know, we've been having discussions with some of our clients, especially as we've come up to PAX, as we go, media's burnt out. They don't want to cover it. They were not hearing any chatter. Uh, consumers are burnt out. Yeah, they're going to watch this, like the Sony showcase that happened yesterday because it's very focused and they know exactly what they're getting. But yeah, right. But then like watching, say, Future Game Show, for example, is it's an hour and a half of somebody's day. It's a crapshoot on what they're going to see. Are they going to invest their time? So I think right now we're in a bit of a, depending on how long this, this whole pandemic situation continues, I think we're at a bit of a crossroads because digital events were great at the beginning because it was new and we were adapting the best we can. Now what we have to learn is we go, which ones are gonna be the big ones? Which ones do you have to say, look, I, we'd love to help you out with some content, but we can't, right? Because the other consideration has also been when a client say wants to be in every single thing, cause they're thinking, look, we got to be as spread wide as possible. Okay. How do we make it interesting from this one to this showcase, to this event, to this event without spreading our assets way too thin, not having anything interesting to talk about that kind of thing. Right. So um, it's definitely, it's been a balance just trying. And I don't think there's a guarantee from any one event to the other. So, so but what I'm hearing for you is, you should, because probably many marketing people are watching us, you should prepare for each show different video material, right? I would I would advise so highly, yeah. I mean, and it's no different than if you were going to go about things the normal way where you're going to release a trailer and then in a couple of weeks you want to have another announcement or another beat, 
if you're regurgitating old content, people are going to know that they already saw it. You know what I mean? You have to be able to be fresh at all times. And that's taxing probably more than ever with these digital events. That's taxing on the internal teams that have to put those assets together and stuff like that. They're probably feeling more burnt out than we are. Okay, so, right? so, so I have a new trailer and two events to show at. Which one should I choose? What, what to look for? Oh, uh, I mean, I think on this case, we just got to go on, on what we know based on past performance, because there's no guarantee. Um, we knew going into IGN Summer of Gaming, okay, they're, it's kind of like the biggest fish in the pond. We know we're gonna get numbers. Some of the smaller events that came our way, we still tried to help them. And if we had something that we could send them, we'd say, look, this is non-exclusive. We're gonna be sharing this with other people just to have it inserted, sure. But where you're gonna place your big bucks is, or, or your bigger efforts is always gonna be the ones that have a proven track record before all this happened because right now it's all this is all up in the air right patrick how do you choose your digital events when 11 bits will show up <laughs> but uh, i know but what are the measurements that you are i know i know it's yeah as sean has said i mean we are like it is a new world that we have to adjust to right and we we have to test things as we go um and obviously, due to the digital character of those events right now, the transparency is like through the roof. You can see whatever you want, and you know that everything stays out there. And that was the case in the past as well, because like we've been treating different events in a different way, right? You had like E3, which was like this media-focused event that was also giving you a huge boost afterwards, like in, uh, in terms of its long tail, right? While all, most of the other events were about meeting media people, uh, meeting your consumers on a, on a show floor, and uh, like networking, all of those things, right? R right now, you don't have that. You want to build your global reach. So, um, so I would say that obviously, like that, the, the, the IGN event was was a big one. Um, I'm not sure if people are to follow those events in the future uh, because it is going to be easier for them to see a short summary, um, get familiar with whatever they want to get familiar with, and then just like cherry pick the most important parts for them, right? No one has time uh, because it is all about information in this new setup that we that we exist in rather than the pleasure of experiencing those things because you are not experiencing those things you are not st like standing in those queues you are not attending the parties you are not doing all of those things that were the most fun part of those events so, so right now you, we have to yeah are you saying that we should like change the way we present the games like shorten the trailers yeah yeah i think so i i, I think that 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 we should keep it as short and sweet as possible. It is about that, like the, the feel like you are to deliver. Right? Right? Yeah. So mine was cool. Uh, before it's um, <laughs> I don't know. I don't know if, if thirty seconds is the right answer. The right answer is that it should be a proper length for whatever you have to, yeah. whatever message you have to pass. Right. Sometimes it's thirty seconds. Sometimes it's going to be thirty minutes. Probably not. But but maybe for for some of the IPs and some of the titles with a scale demanding such an investment uh, on the on the viewer's side right but but basically it's all about passing the message right now rather than creating like a more uh, enriched experience if that makes sense yeah so, i really uh because i want I, to ask about steam and featuring of steam is it worth is it is it major factor in choosing the event because i know some people asked about it how do you think thomas yeah. Sorry, what was the question? How, how important is Steam in the digital events, Steam support? And by Steam support, I mean featuring. Well, I, featuring often is really, really everything. And as we launched Control on Steam 27th of August, like we did extremely well on, on Steam, but it's all about that front page placement and then hitting the discount and 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 all that so so it is but if i if i may go back to your yeah, sure. original question basically again patrick you're talking like my long lost twin um but uh, 
first of all, what is important at this point? Well, it's where you get the most eyes, and that's basically now the platform holder showcases. So Sony State of Play, Xbox Showcase, and we were lucky to be in both. The interesting thing now is but at least... If you have a game on PC, so where? PC Gamer Show? Probably. Um, and then the, the whole interesting thing, it's like I really appreciate IGN and GameSpot and everybody who really tried to kind of replicate that E3, but there's just fatigue. And I remember back in 2006 or whenever when E3 was like, okay, it's too crazy, it's too big, let's go to Santa Monica, let's break it up. Two years of that, and suddenly you don't have this tentpole week where everybody aims for where all the news comes from. And that's kind of the same problem here. Like if it is that one concentrated week, we all work towards it. And you know what? We might bitch and moan at a development studio about E3 and demo dates, but that was that one solid thing in the calendar. You got to hit that date. And now it's just suddenly, well, can you be ready in June? And we're like, maybe. Can you be ready early July? Yeah, maybe. So it's suddenly a lot more um, flexible, which probably isn't that that good. And then just generating all the assets and not just the assets, but generating an interesting story for the media to tell, you only only have so few. It's like, you know, you can you have to do something at E3, we got to do a panel or something, or we get to do a panel or something at PAX or at Digital Dragons. But there's, it sucked when people approached us, which was awesome because it's, awesome that people approach you and want something, but then having to tell them, I got nothing for you, that is less fun. Okay, so so if you have to name like the most, because let's say the pandemic will go into the next year, so which events we should prepare for and be sure that we are on them, Sean, which one would, would you recommend? Well, I mean, I mean, I'm going to assume what we're, we're probably audience wise is we're talking to a lot of, you know, indie developers who yeah. might not have that, you know, that advantage of being able to, I mean, you got to have something pretty special to be able to drop into Microsoft uh, or a Sony, you know, full showcase or something like that. Cause I mean, Thomas is not wrong. I mean, even just looking at yesterday's numbers over one and a half million across Twitch and YouTube watched that PlayStation stream. Right. So that's obviously going to be your bread and butter. Um, I would say that, you know, if we are looking at this in, ter- in, in a long-term type situation where we're going to have at least say for the next year, you know, that we are in this, you know, pandemic situation. I, I mean, my gut would tell me that you need to invest in what's already proven. Um, so you're going to want to go with those tentpole media outlets. And, you know, so, you know, you're going to want to go with your IGNs, you're going to want to go with your PC gaming show. Um, and future, then, I think, was huge, right? Future did pretty well. Yeah, Future did pretty well. Um, and then, you know, but don't rule out some of those smaller ones that might fit your niche. Um, we spoke as a team yesterday as we were kind of preparing, for, as I was preparing for this, and we came around to the, to the wholesome video game showcase. And it did really, really well for what it was because it had an angle and it had something that stood out from the other showcases. So people knew what they were getting into going into that. So keep your eye out, I would say, for something that might stand out as a unique event that might be worth your time. Again, I mean, it's always going to be a crapshoot on something like that. But that's one that came out of this that a lot of games got noted. Kind of walked out of watching that one feeling pretty good. Right? So they, they achieved their goal. Um, and then I would just be wary of, you know, if X website suddenly decides that they're going to do a showcase, I mean, do your homework, look at the website, look at the kind of traffic they generate, look at how they generate their traffic, you know, like, do they have people that are going to come there organically, or are they highly SEO dependent? So therefore, they're probably not going to get that transition into their live event, that kind of thing. Just kind of do your research on a smaller one and, and you know, it can't hurt to get into it if you've got the assets there to do it. But if you have to focus on one or the other, go for your tent poles for sure. Okay, Patrick, what are your favorites? Firstly, I think that we should look at it from a different angle, slightly different angle, especially nowadays. I would say that you should choose your events depending on your timing and uh, depending on your schedule in terms of the campaign and in terms of the development cycle, right? So, so knowing knowing your, your launch window, you should think about the landscape and think about what is about to happen 
and then pick the event and then do what, what exactly what, what Sean told you about, meaning think about, not about the scale necessarily, think about the profile of the event first. Maybe you've got a game that comes from a specific genre or has like addresses some needs of a specific crowd and that crowd maybe is very much interested in one event or, or one type of events or maybe it is not about the event maybe it is about like a, a a communication platform you name it right i think that it may be the case that in the nearest future we're going to see a shift in the landscape uh, where those events will transform into something that is not especially not not, not especially like uh defined in time but maybe they are like they, they, they maybe they they are going to convert into something that is long term, um, uh, some kind of a uh, ongoing ongoing platform. I, I don't know. There are like so many things that that, that can happen uh, in, in that particular matter. Uh, but but the most important part is that you should think about the like the the, the profile of the event crossed with the profile of your game crossed with the timing of your campaign and this is a proper way to approach that in my opinion but what do i know <laughs> Thomas, and you? I, I think you're making a good point though and just don't just see an event and go oh we have an option that we can go in there and maybe you can throw together an asset if it doesn't fit with your timing you know i mean if you're going to throw an asset out just to be bring up awareness but then you're going to go dark for eight months you're yeah. wasting that asset, you know what I mean? Yeah. So you having yeah. a little bit of forethought on what you're really gonna get out of the event itself, and then what you're aiming for, for long-term down the road as part of your plan uh, is really important. Thomas, and your advice, how to, how to what events should we attend? As a, Am I incredibly bl blurry in your camera? Yeah, you're blurry. Okay. <laughs> Even better looking than you were five minutes ago. <laughs> well, I have a, I have a face. <laughs> I have a fa face for radio, as, as they say. Um, like how to choose, like with which event. Like, I, like what what Sean said about like being consistent is is important. So it's just like going to an event. Just well, we can just put this asset out here. Like you always need a plan, like a long term plan. Like how are you telling the story and 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 all all that. But of course, it's like depending on your niche like the fact that there's more choice in events and thus the audience that's pretty that's pretty good as as well so maybe i rephrase the question because if you are not a triple a game and, and a headliner of a show if you're an indie developer how early should i contact the the, the event organizers to, to talk to them about me being in there look this this is like because traditionally there's this cliche that fiends are just not very good at selling and when i was a journalist like i'd get an email hey release this game today can you help us out and i'm like you're like <laughs> at least like a year or two late so i'd i'd be always be a go-getter like go try to sell your game and and be early like and always think about like always think about what the story is that you're trying to tell like always think about not well here's some assets like no you have to actually uh, or here's a press release no like sell them an idea of like here's what's interesting about this like that's what we what uh, what we always do it's like try to kind of give something that's already kind of readily presentable so so one thing that digital dragons is famous for is getting people drunk i i i I think it's not a big secret in there. Uh, and during this networking thing, you usually bump into journalists, other stuff, other, other people you make connections and you can promote your game. So how to approach and how to connect with journalists without getting them drunk, Sean? Uh, <laughs> of course you can drink well, on Zoom, but I think it's, it's not the same. I don't think it's always about drinking. Like, let's let's be clear on that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I mean, it's nice, like, segue. I think, I think um, you know, like there's a certain sense of, uh, one of my coworkers put it yesterday is serendipity in a sense where when you're at an event, you have those moments where you're gonna bump into somebody in a lineup or you're gonna be out at a party and you know, a quick casual conversation. Oh, you're this person, you work here. And you know, lots of, lots of connections and, and whatnot come out of that. So obviously we're all, we're all starving for that right now. Um, as much as, you know, I, we chatted just before we kind of jumped yeah. on to being live here, like something like Twitter, social media, 
uh, can be a bit taxing on your mental health. Um, I find that that's been a little bit more vital uh, over this stretch of just kind of keeping up with what certain people are doing, keeping up with what they're covering rather than trying to go to every single website and stuff like that and making connections that way, commenting, making sure you're interacting with people, especially if it's something where you have a unified interest, even if it's just on a game that you both like. But using your social media has been more important. Um, I also try, I mean, you know, obviously you guys probably all get it is in this business, we send a lot of emails, mm -hmm. like a ridiculous, stupid amount of emails. And, you know, we'd like to maybe make every single email, the most personal email we've ever sent to somebody to, to have that connection. It, you can't always do that. Um, so I pick and choose, like I have people that I have really good established relationships with that I can afford to maybe make it a bit more blanket. But if I'm really working on a relationship, trying to get to know somebody, I wanna know the games they like, I wanna know what interests them, I'll take the time to make those emails right now a little bit more personal, just try to make that connection. Because I think one of the things it's important to understand is the journalist that's on the other side of that email, right now they're in the shit too. They're in the exact same situation we are. So they're looking for that connection, right? So when you're, if you put a genuine piece of, of interest in there, and a question maybe inviting them to email you back, you can start building those little bits of connection. I think the hard part is that there's just no replacement for seeing somebody face to face and being able to give them a handshake. You know, the, nothing replaces actual human contact. So uh, I think right now we're all kind of behind the eight ball a little bit and just it's doing what you can to make your connections. So, so I found that when you're looking for people, you just do the, the, the tags or, or, or subjects into the Google Alert so you will know who is writing about stuff that you do. So then you will get to know the authors that you should follow. And Patrick, what's your uh, secrets or your methods of approaching and uh, maintaining relations and getting to know journalists without I'm not good touch? at that. I'm not good at that at all. <laughs> this is why... Remember, right? <laughs> this is why I have like a good team that 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 deals with that part. Um, I, but, but honestly, I think that uh, we are in a comfortable position due to the fact that we've been um, part of the industry for some time, like all of us here, and that gives us this privilege of being able. Uh, like to reach out to those people that we know, having those connections and whatnot, if that makes sense. So, so I think that if we build those connections right now, it will be highly challenging. And it is going to be highly challenging for those people that are starting right now, those people that are trying to, to reach out to, to media outlets, to, to reach out to those people that can give them some uh, some visibility because uh, that's how we are constructed as human beings <laughs> when you and it, it is not about necessarily about drinking partying doing whatever it is about like simple handshake it is about like getting to know yourself or each other right and and that that works greatly if you have a possibility of doing that without it well we are we are sentenced to like exchanging those emails Stupid amount of them, <laughs> as Sean has stated, and uh, but uh, and, and probably with time we're gonna we're gonna adjust to that and we're gonna treat that as something uh, as something more natural. But I think that that hopefully things are gonna get better with time, and in a year or two we're gonna be able to uh, uh, to some degree get, get back to our like natural routine. And would you suggest asking fellow indie developer for help if they know somebody, some journalist? It's, absolutely. Like I, the great thing about 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 our industry, and actually, it is something that that is pretty healthy in terms of of, of gaming as such, um, from the publishing slash production slash whatever um, side of things, is that even though we do exist in the same market, we are not competing with each other like head to head. Uh, we've we've got such a different products. We've got like our like development process usually is so long that that we're gonna find a space to 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 do our thing whatever our peers and colleagues are doing so like helping out each other is what we should do because like when one company grows it creates a space for all the other companies this is how we see it and actually it proves to be 
proof proves to be true for for at, at least for for our environment i would say so well yeah we should we we are we are riding the same card basically so 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 like getting to to those media people through your colleagues through however you can as long as it's healthy and transparent well yeah do your best Thomas. yeah again pretty much um the same same as patrick that it's 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 nice that you know i've been around a long time so you kind of it's more about cherishing the relationships really than starting starting new ones and like the dynamic with let's say more traditional media versus let's say influencers is very different anyway in terms of how you stay in touch and 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 so on uh but i've definitely and look i mean we're not in like a key market territory neither me, me me or patrick so you know it's it's always been about a lot of email anyway yeah. um you know sure yeah. you go to your e3s and 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 whatnot but ultimately a lot, lot of the work is the relationship management really is um or friendship management in many cases is is about that email but i've definitely been been a bit more active about just actually getting into yet another zoom call like hey let's actually like see some faces and just like not a lot of agenda, but let's let's just kind of like see see where we are and how people are doing. And the irony to me has been that before all this, I would pretty actively talk to my colleagues, people who do my job. Um, but then now there's so much communication, so I do a lot less of that <laughs> because like all the communications <laughs> folks are just kind of like okay, like not not anymore. Um, so I'm trying to kind of be a bit better better uh, uh, about that. Uh, so I don't think ultimately that's changed that much, but absolutely it's like, you know, when you sit down and you have a drink or eat together or just be at an event and you're both tired at demoing, but you kind of see the excitement of people playing your game and all that, like not, nothing kind of beats that. Okay, so another problem that we're facing right now is we have no uh, shows, no, <laughs> no journalists. So how to do a preview? Or behind closed doors, not to leak everything, not to send it. How do you deal with that, Thomas? Because it's, well, I think it's a bit of a challenge in these times when you cannot invite people. It, of- it is, it is, and it is not. So first of all, I mean, up to this, before March, I tended to travel like 80 to 90 days a year. I like traveling. I'm built to travel and be at events. So I went completely away, away from that. Um, when you go to like an event, like there's the stress of, does the game work? Does the demo, is it good enough? And does the build work? Oh, we forgot to update the firmware, all of these usual things that happen when you go to an event and the internet sucks and you're like, ah, oh, okay. Um, so th- the problem now that, especially on next gen and all this 4K stuff is that the fidelity, you know, when you do an event physically, you're gonna have that lovely TV and an audio system, or at least headphones. Uh, so you can really kind of sell that. Uh, but for example, we did uh, the Crossfire X campaign demos July. And Microsoft hand- handles that. So literally, I got out of that door at 7 a.m., <laughs> turned on Discord. That's what we chose to use. And then it's like, well, good morning or evening, Australia. And, and like, you know, you chat, your camera is on. Um, and then you just um, pressed play on the video file that was your behind closed doors demo so in some ways simpler but you're not in the room you're not reading the reaction you're not kind of reacting to that like yeah, like but, let, but that's hands so, off and hands on demos would you did you find well, this problem? this was did, well yeah that's a good point that these were all hands off and and when we did Control second expansion AWE, we decided to do our own stream, but that was actually the plan for like the longest of time because of the Alan Wake connection, everything. I was like, it's DLC, you know, the attach rate is low, there's less risk, but we know we have interest. So we so we went all out on Twitch, spent some money on that as well. And that did extremely well um, for us, but that was a more complicated setup where some of us were in the office, some, some were not. But when it comes to actually people doing the preview and playing well you know in a control expansion it's like well you know here's your epic store keep like that's not really all that complicated but in terms of like i've looked at what uh you know the cdp folks have done with cyberpunk and i think they use like nvidia's 
uh, streaming service, which is really, really, really good. Um, but I'd say when we're looking at the next couple of years at Remedy, um, and I don't think this pandemic, this will last at least like another year. I don't think there's, I'm, I'm, not, I'm pretty sure there's no E3 next year either, um, at least physically. We're definitely thinking a lot more about like when we are going to do a demo that probably might have to be packaged up in a way that's easily distributable. Now on PC, this is very easy, ultimately, yeah. like on Steam and EGS, this is easy. Console, of course, is just that that's a whole nother pain point on how to distribute stuff and demos, especially on first party backends, which are great. Um, but but that's definitely moving forward. We think a lot more about that. It's not about like, well, it works on that one PC or kit that we built <laughs> barely. So you got to be a lot, a lot better about that. But I think it's a very long answer. But in general, also, yeah, I think it's a um, question. Uh, just quickly, um, like I think we've also gone from like having these two or three year ridiculous PR campaigns. We're all wanting to do like maximum 12 months, probably six months, which also means that the by, by the time you're going to show what you have, it's much more of a real display of what you have instead of like a very custom built demo, which are always so taxing and expensive. Patrick, how did you dealt with? Uh, fortunately for us, we didn't have to do those like big previews just yet during the time of pandemics. And it is something that is ahead of us. And uh, yes, we, we are trying. Actually, we had those discussions like a few days ago about to, how to cope with that because it is challenging. Again, uh, as, uh, as Thomas has said, like due to the human factor, I, I want to read the room. I want to know what the reaction is, what the reaction is, and to adjust the presentation to to that, right? And you either have to like in those in, in that kind of a remote situation, it is for you to either adjust the pacing of your presentation or the quality of the presentation, because you cannot have both. Either you're gonna pass the content to to, to the viewer, and you're gonna have to like count on the viewer like managing the pacing on uh, in a proper way. Or you're gonna want to like keep it under your control, but then you have to count on a proper connection, and the connectivity can be like varied, tricky. Uh, especially yeah, tricky, especially nowadays. So, so well, there there is no perfect scenario, I suppose, but but I won't be able to give you like a proper solution as I have not tested it out yet. Um, the only like release that we had right now was like the biggest one was 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 the last dlc for frostpunk and and we had managed to 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 reach out to the to the media outlets and to present the game and whatnot but but that it, it wasn't necessary for us to do anything live with our upcoming titles we're gonna need to do some live showcasing and We'll see about it. We're going to have to figure something out. But, so before but, I ask Sean about his clients, how they managed to do it, I can tell that what we did with Nintendo Switch Dev Kit, we just stream it on the Discord and ask press to tell us what to do to prove to them that this is a working code and not pre-coded well, video. Th that's the one thing, right? But the, the other one is like for two of the titles that we do have right now, like the, the, the graphical, the aesthetical fidelity is like, in my opinion, through the roof. And you want to be able to show that streaming yeah, the game. True. There is such a huge, like when you see the game in 4K with all the details and all the flair, there is no way you can pass that, like just streaming the game. So you, you, need you, literally, to you literally have to pass the video file. Like that's yes. that's that's the yeah. thing. It's like oh, I was the streaming and that's the version the, 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 when, yeah. when we did the crossfire stuff. I was some part of me was thinking why why didn't we just send this entire eleven minute video of the level that we yeah. played because you would get better quality. Yeah. You yeah. know, it there's just no point in playing it live, like it's just over complicating things. Like we recorded it live, but there's no fakery or um 
or or anything but like yeah like patrick said the quality takes such a hit like even now when we do company-wide meetings on zoom and we show like well here's like a new thing it's just like the art directors are just like in tears <laughs> yeah but this grainy is grainy and blurry <laughs> yeah 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 and okay, we, just one quickly like if people haven't demoed in a room like you do 30 demos at E3, you look at like, oh, these are Italians, these are Russians, Hungarians, Finns, you know, all the dynamics are different. Like, even though you don't deviate that much from the demo script, man, do you deviate in body language and how do you react to things? Yeah. And like some people in the demos, they might actually like talk during the demo, like just pointing stuff out and you react to that. Some are dead. Qu so, so it's a very like, we. so we had none of that when we do Discord. You're like... I wonder how that went because I can't see them and I have no idea. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> how your clients are coping with this and you, of course, as an agency. So, I mean, I think, I, I mean, from our side, the, the hurdle that we're seeing is less so in terms of presentation, you know, like Patrick and Thomas are talking about being on the publisher side and more about getting actual follow through and notice on those previews or interest in those previews um, to begin with. Um, there's nothing like doing the face to face. I mean, you can ask Patrick, you know, we did our little trip across the United States, you know, yeah. uh, uh, highlighting some 11 bit games and being able to just have somebody come in, shake your hand, play the game while you're able to provide that feedback and it's presented in the way that you want. Not only are you making the connection with that person where they're more likely to actually cover it and write a proper preview, but just by having that connection, they feel a little bit more indebted to make sure that they follow through, right? There's a, you know, there's a reason for them to follow through. Now we're looking at, we don't have those chances to shake people's hands. And we also got to understand that, you know, journalists and media are probably getting more, I mean, not like they already didn't get email. I mean, I remember my journalist days and I would wake up on a Tuesday morning, which was always news day back in the day. And I'm like, I've got 150 goddamn emails and you didn't want to, but it's like, control, batch, delete, and you're like, I just don't have time for all this, right? So not we're, we're not only competing with an incredible amount of, of, you know, clutter in somebody's inbox and stuff like that, but everybody is trying to do the same thing. Well, we want you to preview our game. Well, we want you to preview our game. So the hurdle is first making the connection and getting that genuine interest for the product. But I think the bigger hurdle after that is, is yeah, you're gonna get a McKee or, or whatnot, and all you have to, you know, all you have available to yourself is to email them and go, so did you play it? What did you think? You know, hey, maybe you could write something up about it, but there's just no guarantees. Mm -hmm. And that's, I think, has the, been the biggest struggle. So you really got to work on, on your pitch. Make sure that if you are pitching a preview that, I mean, you've only got two or three lines, you know, in your opening paragraph. Don't bury your lead. Tell them what you're looking for. Tell them what you've got and make sure that it's interesting. And then don't be afraid to follow up. Um, a lot of people are, you know, they get a little tentative of that, say, second or third email. You know, I mean, there is a line that you draw because you don't ever want to be annoying. But don't be afraid to, like, initial pitch. Okay, they didn't respond. Send them a second one. Okay, they didn't respond. Send them that third one and be like, I just want to make sure that hey, it's amazing <laughs> how... Well, it's amazing how, you know, having that little RE in front of your subject line on an email, someone's like, I see that they know that they missed something. Oh, okay, geez, I better open that. And you you get way better responses. So just don't be afraid to be a bit assertive. Just don't cross the line to be annoying and hopefully those results will come for you. But it's definitely been a challenge getting noticed in all of this. So I have another question. Uh, because we have like last, I think, eight minutes or so. I have a tough question also, Sean, for you, because not only have pandemic outside, but also a lot of social unrests, right? So. Does video companies want to get involved? Pros should we react, stay silent? What is your advice or best practices? Because there's a lot of this stuff going on in different countries. Of course, there are different causes and different address. But what should we? There's. I'd say that there's no real right answer for that. It's such a tough one. Yeah. Um, <laughs> because well, no, because a lot of these things that are a lot of these social unrest issues are important and they're worth talking about. Um, but there's a difference between saying that you support something and then just walking away from that statement versus saying you support something and then backing it up with efforts 
with whether that's donating to certain charities. But what you don't want to do is just be vapid about it and say, hey, yeah, we support this thing and then move on like onto the next topic and don't make it a thing. Uh, you're going to be caught and called out on that pretty quick. Right. So don't be empty about what you support. And should like we looked into like other countries, like we Polish people should look into America, what's happening in there and react or should it stay in so. your region? Well, I mean, it, it depends, right? Yeah, I, mean, I know. Uh, I'm just asking for like guidance. I know that every case. Yeah, yeah. Well, let's sort of say so. So an interesting way to look at it, though, is that oh, my phone's ringing. Figures. <laughs> uh, an interesting way to look at that is is that. Um, Say they're, actually, calling, example, they're calling you to avoid this subject. <laughs> yeah, they're like, they're like Sean, <laughs> stop talking. <laughs> no, so I, I, I've actually encountered this with some other companies that I've worked with, uh, a couple of them actually in Poland, where um, it's just there's a certain sense of unawareness about how maybe North American culture might react versus, you know, uh, how the culture exists in Poland, in Finland, in, in, yeah. in anywhere, right? So making sure that you have somebody, if you're if you're wanting to approach something in a North American market, make sure you're talking to somebody in that North American market who understands how that works and says, hey, you should probably step around that. That's not for you to comment on. Or I mean, and we do that with everything. It's not just social unrest, but content in games and stuff like that, that people m might be sensitive to. So you just got to make sure that you understand the market that you're trying to work into. Uh, Patrick, uh, and uh, one, I think the last question, you know, the last question, that your publishing calendar changed because of pandemic, because usually like summer was a dead zone for games because nobody was playing. And with the pandemic and the lockdown, did anything change and will change in the uh, schedule of publishing? Mm -hmm. I don't think, uh, well, firstly, I don't think that that summer has been a dead zone for the last few years. It has changed a few years ago and it was changing on a yearly basis, slowly. It was the case like half of the generation ago, meaning like when we talk about like the, the console generation maybe, but the last the last few years were pretty intense and those summers were packed with, with, with multiple games. Well, like strong titles uh, were like released a, a year ago, two years ago, three years ago, and whatnot. And I think that like pandemic is about to change that as well because like, everything is changing in terms of the schedule and in terms of the pacing of those campaigns and whatnot. But I don't think that we're going to adjust our release calendar to the pandemic. We do have everything locked and we're going to keep it that way, observing some things and maybe like making some slight adjustments, but, but no major revolution is about to come to our, to our release calendar due to the fact that the, that, that the pandemic is, is present or not. It is just about like using proper channels and proper tools, not revo revolutionizing everything, just because of the fact that 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 some things are changing. So no, I, I don't think that we're gonna we're gonna like put everything upside down. We're gonna we're gonna make some slight adjustments maybe uh, if they are like uh, beneficial for us. But but it is it is just about staying on top of the things and 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 being aware like being um what's the term um ah oh, popped out of my head um uh, vigilant right that's the term uh, um staying vigilant and then uh, being aware of it is now <laughs> it, it is now okay that must it, end it with yeah did you did you um, change the publishing schedule because of pandemic or will you or are you seeing the benefits of changing it? Uh, no, we, we no. kind of, if, if there is any luck in this situation, uh, we were in a pretty good position that games were either far along in development, sort of far less impacted. But what Patrick was saying, like one, the hardest part, you were saying this, I think, half an hour ago, the hardest part is the creative part. So the games that are years down the line are impacted because people can't be in the same room. It's like the fantasy phase of like coming up with all the ideas. Look at this, look at what I have on the monitor. Let, let's experiment on that. That's just really, really, really hard to do. Um, but it hasn't really, hasn't really impacted uh, production too bad. Uh, there's some things that are a lot more difficult, like QA is probably was the hard, hardest hitting over hardest hit. Uh, and then just like, inspecting visual quality like streams not good enough for that so for like 
VFX oh, yeah. and art direction, this is actually like really, really difficult. Well, easy now because people can go back to the office. But um, I think it's when we present stuff, that's going to change because lack of events and all that. Okay, yeah, so you know the, yeah, you know what the, what the question is like. All the, the all the TV spots you can see those compilations of uh, of the quarantine TV spots, and they are all about the same things, and they are all using the same vocabulary and whatnot. The question is if all the games in four years will be about isolation, <laughs> <laughs> and I think we'll finish with that because we have a last. Three seconds left. So, guys, thanks a lot. I think it was really interesting for me because you answered all of my questions that I was struggling with. Thanks a lot, and see you. Yeah, thanks thank very much. Bye-bye. Take care. Thanks. Cheers. Bye.